what I'd like to do for the next 15 minutes is uh, speak to you about management of inverted papilloma, which has certainly changed over the course of our careers. Disclosures, uh, not different from uh, yesterday. I'm going to talk about uh, management and decision making. I'm going to talk about uh, open versus endoscopic management, uh, some endoscopic techniques, and some concluding remarks. So uh, just for in the way of background, uh, it's a benign nasal epithelial tumor. It was described in 1854. It's relatively uncommon. You know, its association with HPV is sort of plus minus. I mean, they're clearly uh, in... It's intuitive, I think, to all of us that there is a close association with HPV, although we can't always find it. But all the cases of cancer seem to have 16 or 18 in it. So it seems that at least in the cancer cases, it's, uh, it's associated. Uh, it has certain characteristics. It tends to sort of invade. Uh, it tends to recur. And there's a, a relatively high incidence of squamous cell carcinoma. The 13% probably reflects a little bit of a referral uh, bias. But definitely, if there is a lesson to this, case, to this lecture, it's beware of any unilateral process in the sinuses, for sure. Uh, this is its appearance. You can see it sort of has those characteristic small red bumps on it. It doesn't look kind of smooth uh, like a typical inflammatory polyp does. It has a little bit of uh, undulation to it. There's a staging system, uh, which is basically uh, an, more or less an anatomic staging system confining to the nose, involving the OMC and medial maxillary sinus and ethmoid, other sinuses, uh, and then extra sinus involvement. Uh, it, it's a system that we use only modestly, to be perfectly honest with you, because it really matters about the details of the tumor and, most importantly, its site of attachment. So what do we need to do to, to treat this tumor? This is still a surgical uh, disease. So uh, we resect the tumor, and we must include the base of the tumor, the point of attachment to the sinuses. And we remove that bone, or we burr down the base in order to um, uh, free that area of involvement and reduce the chance of recurrence. There isn't really a non-surgical strategy. There are some odd cases where radiation therapy may be appropriate, certainly mal malignant cases possibly uh, cases that can, are unresectable or multiply recurrent. But the truth is that this is a surgical problem. So we in, evaluate our approaches and how they've evolved over time. Uh, there are, um, uh, was initially a transnasal approach, sort of a polypectomy, if you will. And obviously, there was a very um, high incidence of recurrence in those cases. Uh, so radical surgery uh, was sort of tried a bit in order to sort of get around the tumor, if you will. And those have been uh, supplanted by much more tailored approaches. And those really were introduced uh, long ago in the 80s. Medial maxillectomy was kind of the, um, the tried and true gold standard, if you will, for inverted papilloma cases. And when I was in residency, that was kind of our quote unquote standard operation. Uh, because you really didn't have a, uh, a tremendous ability to see the base of the tumor uh, right off the bat. So the surgical management um, for um, uh, open approaches, it has some advantages. There's the possibility of an on-block resection. It certainly was, um, was nice when we did those medial maxillectomies, potentially through a lateral rhinotomy or, or a degloving approach, and the whole thing came out um, at once, and you had everything sort of in your hand, uh, although we don't always realize that. Uh, open approaches can definitely access some areas that are more difficult to instrument endoscopically. The anterior maxillary sinus uh, is one of those. Um, you can argue that you can potentially do uh, an endoscopic Denker's approach, uh, where you remove part of the piriform aperture, et cetera. I've, tr I've done that approach. I've actually not been particularly happy with it. And I think that a sublabial uh, incision is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, and so typically, instead of doing a, a case where there's uh, anterior or inferior involvement endoscopically, I'll typically combine an endoscopic approach with a sublabial approach. Uh, and here's an example of a patient where you can see that there's um, anterior uh, involvement in the maxillary sinus. Um, the areas in the nasolacrimal duct also are somewhat um, uh, more challenging to get endoscopically. And again, I will typically do a sublabial approach to these, uh, and those patients heal up extremely well. Uh, and uh, the potential exists to do uh, an endoscopic medial maxillectomy if it is indeed confined. So it really, the devil is in the details of where in the nasolacrimal duct it might be involved as to whether an endoscopic approach is appropriate or not. But those are, are the minority of cases. The lateral frontal sinus, if it's past the meridian of the orbit, that's another area that's uh, difficult or 
um, impossible to get uh, endoscopically with good accuracy with our present instrumentation. And so those are cases that uh, still uh, have an open approach as the best uh, method. So here's a case. Uh, we're looking up into the uh, frontal sinus. Um, this is actually the septum here. Uh, this is the uh, patient's left frontal sinus where the uh, tumor had previously been located. If you take a flexible endoscope, this is in the office, and look up and over, you see that in the lateral frontal sinus there is residual papilloma in that patient. And so that patient ultimately did get an open approach so that that entire tumor could be um, resected uh, confidently. So how do you decide uh, what to do? Your physical examination, your imaging are, are obviously very important. What approach to use depends on the tumor base, uh, uh, where that base of tumor is, and surgeon preference. Here's an example of a patient looking in the left side of the nose. That's the middle turbinate. You can see there's papilloma kind of surrounding it. But here's the tumor removed. So it really was the middle turbinate that was the problem, and there wasn't an, uh, an attachment anywhere else. And so the approach really has to be tailored to where the tumor is arising from, where the base of the tumor is. And I think that's been the greatest advancement over the last 20 years or so is that we really tailor our approaches to the individual characteristics of the tumor. Here again, you can see an anterior tumor on the patient's left side uh, that um, I did via a sublabial approach. Uh, here's a, a patient. Uh, the pathology is actually on the patient's right side. And what you can see is some thickening uh, of the bone over here and the attachment. And this is, in fact, the papilloma that the patient uh, suffered from. Uh, and um, that resection happened um, endoscopically, and I'll show that in a moment. But it, you, have to, you have to be self-critical and look at what the results of open versus endoscopic are. And in this sort of early review of these patients, with a pretty good follow-up, five-year follow-up is, is, um, uh, is excellent follow-up for patients with this disease. Uh, the recurrence rate with endoscopic was 12. The open was about 18. Obviously, that is not... Uh, uh, that's not a randomized prospective study, so there could be some uh, bias that's represented in that. The harder cases you do open, quote-unquote, and the easier cases you do endoscopically. So uh, that's not the be-all and end-all, but definitely um, moves us in one direction. Uh, and maxillary and lateral frontal recess required a sublabial approach. This is an incredibly important fact. So what happens to patients with recurrence? Well, in these case, cases, Roy Cassiano had these 51 cases reviewed, there were recurrences, but most of them were just managed in the office or with minor procedures in the operating room. And the endoscopic uh, ability to uh, follow these patients is, is absolutely critical. And so these approaches, I think endoscopic, you have improved resection. You can see the site of attachment for these patients. The visualization to determine the site of attachment is excellent before you complete the resection. So you use your microdebreeder. You just carefully microdebreed the tumor without causing any trauma to the surrounding mucosa, and you just microdebreed it back until you find the base. The follow-up in the office is one of the most important things. In fact, again, you know, David Kennedy would say, what's the greatest advance in inverted papilloma treatment? He would say endoscopic follow-up. You find them when they're tiny. You can often take care of them in the office, and um, it's a better result for the patient. The CT hyperostosis that I talked to you about uh, corresponds to the tumor base in 89% or so, so in a high percentage of patients. And so you can use that to guide your endoscopic resection, um, but uh, really the, uh, the proof's in the pudding. You have to see what you see in the operating room. So for this uh, same patient, uh, endoscopic approach, in this case I decided to resect that thickened bone on the periorbita. This is on the patient's right side. You can see the uh, bone here, the bone cutting edge of the periorbita. That patient did very nicely with that uh, particular procedure. Um, sometimes, though, the, the base can be dis somewhat deceiving on imaging. I mean, look at this. This, this was actually all tumor. This uh, entire sinus was uh, filled with tumor, and it was extending out into the nose. And so, uh, so what do you do with this type of patient? Well, um, you do what you always do. You microdebreed it down. Uh, this is looking now into the lateral maxillary sinus on the patient's left side. That's medial. That's lateral. That's the orbital floor. And the site of attachment was right there. So that whole tumor, that big volume of you know three to four centimeters of tumor, was attached in a one square centimeter base lateral in the maxillary sinus, which if you look at the CT scan, is right there. <laughs> 
and that was the site of attachment of that particular tumor. And in fact, I've seen that a number of times. You can see it in this case as well. Uh, that was the site of attachment for that tumor. This sort of the nipple sign uh, is uh, one of the uh, uh, types of hyperostosis you see in the maxillary sinus. Right there. <clears throat> but sometimes you need an extended approach, improving visualization. For this tumor, this is the uh, left side of the nose, uh, the septum here, middle turbinate. Lateral is over there, and you can see the tumor. Uh, but once you resect that, uh, it was actually attached there on the uh, lateral side of the inner sinus septum, on the frontal sinus, just that little uh, one area of attachment. Looking up into the frontal, the frontal was opacified, but here it is, clean and clear. Uh, and that was a nice example of an extended endoscopic approach that was helpful um, in resecting that tumor. Targeted surgery can be used for difficult-to-reach areas. Here's a 60-year-old guy who was referred for a positive CT scan. Uh, he had biopsies done at um, an otolaryngologist's office outside, CT and an MR. Here's the CT, the coronal CT. Obviously, there's a unilateral process going on there. Uh, filling up the sphenoid. You can see there's dehiscence here into the middle fossa. Here's the MR. You can see the same here. And so for this case, also an endoscopic approach, uh, I used the microiter beater very judiciously, however, uh, but it is helpful in re reducing uh, tumor bulk. Uh, and you always have to have the opening of the microiter breeder um, in your sites. And that, I think, is, is the critical issue with using a microiter breeder is you always have to be able to see the opening of the microiter breeder when you're working. You can't stick it into something, as we heard before, with some of the complications. Uh, and here we're looking now into the sphenoid sinus. We have uh, the characteristic uh, appearance, and the carotid is there. <clears throat> and here we have that area of dehiscence. Uh, and we're looking now, it required a transpterygoid approach, uh, and that's the, the IMAX. It's got a nice clip on it. Uh, and this was a very nice endoscopic resection. Uh, and again, the um, surveillance was important in this patient. Uh, and um, <clears throat> about nine months later, I noticed this in the office, this area, and that was an area of recurrence. It was a little bit away from the area of dehiscence, fortunately. But it's uh, on the, the posterior part of the medial orbital wall, and you can see that otherwise he's very not, well... Uh, mucosalized. Um, everything else looks really nice. And so, uh, I, you know, he was uh, from uh, Nevada, and he had come a long way, and I was like, you know, I think we can take care of this right now. So I just had him wait till the end of the clinic, injected that, used a caudal, made a little incision, um, elevated that area, um, just used some silver nitrate on the back of that, and um, uh, and that was the end of that problem for him. So this is an, an example where the endoscopic surveillance allowed me to find a tumor that was very small that I could handle right there in the office, even though it was previously a very extensive uh, kind of nasty-looking tumor. Uh, but there it was all handled. And what I, I would tell you that, that the protocol that I use for these patients in terms of my endoscopic surveillance is that I usually follow them about every uh, four months for the first two years. 90% of these patients, if they recur, will recur in the first two years. And then I follow them every six months until five years. Uh, and then after that, uh, approximately yearly. So uh, I, have a, I, I tell them in advance, uh, before, you know, before I do the surgery, I say, we're going to have a nice long relationship with each other. And this is what protocol we're going to follow. I'm going to see every four months for two years. I'm going to see every six and then every year. So they know in advance kind of what they're getting into, what the best thing is for them. So in conclusion, um, inverted papilloma can be resected with a, a really low incidence of recurrence um, in general. Uh, the endoscopic approaches really allow for reduced morbidity. Besides external incisions, I think you take less out uh, and uh, have a better result. I think that the visualization of the attachment is really superior to what you can get with an open approach. I think no one would argue that that, attach that uh, uh, patient with a sphenoid sinus uh, papilloma would be better handled via an open approach, as an example. The hyperostosis on the CT can often give you a clue as to the site of attachment uh, of that um, tumor. And endo endoscopes allow for very close follow-up and early detection of the recurrence. And here's a view, a picture I took from the top of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, a view which you're, evidently they don't let people up anymore. Uh, and I just want to say I, I think this might be my last... Um, 
my last talk, and so I wanted to thank everyone for your attention. It was great being in the lab, and obviously I want to thank you know Greg for his uh, stewardship. Mm -hmm.